the Lord had really put into my heart to deal with a couple different things tonight. And one area I wanted to um, really work with is the area of the occult. And uh, a lot of Christians, uh, you know, have have asked me. I've, in fact, Thursday night I have a big series going on the occult and and deliverance and things of that nature. And you know, a lot of it, it is kind of an area that a lot of churches don't get into. They just don't like to touch it for some reason, although it's part of the gospel. It's a very uh, powerful part of the gospel because the Lord, you know, commissioned us to go out and deliver the ones who are oppressed and were possessed, were sick, right? Of all nature of things. And a lot of times we go and uh, we pray for people and there are a lot of people that are what I call defeated Christians. And they're, you know, they're just kind of constantly um, beat down. And they never quite get the, the total victory. Now, I want to share with you one particular thing, and that is, I've had people ask me, well, can a, can a Christian be demon-possessed? No, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. He can be oppressed to such a point that you may think he's demon-possessed, but he cannot be demon-possessed. Where light dwells, darkness flees. It's just that simple. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be filled with with an unholy spirit because where light is, darkness will flee. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're out here sowing some different kinds of things that you're not going to be afflicted by it. Because if you're out there, uh, you know, sowing seeds, then uh, you're going to get a harvest. There's a guaranteed a harvest for sowers. Guaranteed. And I've had some Christians that and done a lot of counseling and, and a lot of deliverance type ministry and things of that nature. And I had one girl who was a heroin addict for a long time. The Lord delivered her. She was just healed. It was a it was a real miracle. And it was fabulous. And um, she had a baby. And her baby she gave to her mother-in-law. And uh, her mother-in-law was raising the baby. <clears throat> and what ended up happening, as this girl grew in her faith and everything for a year, she felt she was strong, she was ready, she was living for the Lord. She went back and tried to get the baby from the mother-in-law. And the mother-in-law said... You cannot have the baby back ever. We have legally taken the baby. And she absolutely was devastated. Absolutely devastated. And she told me, she said, I cannot understand how come God would do that to me. Why would God do that to me after I've repented, after I've done all of those things? I said, you don't understand you do not understand what it means when you talk about sowing and reaping. You don't understand. You see, when you were a rotten character, you sowed, didn't you? You were sowing every kind of a rotten thing that you wanted to do. You were throwing it in there. You know, immorality, dope, you know, every kind of thing that goes along with it. And there's a lot of things that go along with it. Now, after you've done that, you accept Jesus, and then you turn around and you say, Oh, harvest, don't come up. Harvest is coming up. Period. I don't care what you say, harvest is coming up. Now, what you have to do is you have to start planting a new harvest. You have to start over planting, over planting, over planting, over planting, over planting, and eventually, people are not going to look at you as a weed. For instance, if you if I take this fellow and I get in my car and we go out here and we get to this to this um, weed patch and we get out of the car and I and I look at this big thing and I say, What is that? As far as you can see. He's gonna say weeds. So that's right, it's weeds. Now what if I go out there and cultivate that? 
and we really work it and we do everything. And pretty soon you see this beautiful grains of wheat just blowing there and, and just as far as you can see. Now I get him in my car again, we go back down there. And now we get out and I say, okay, what is that? He's going to say that's wheat. He doesn't say it's weeds. He says it's wheat. I'd say, okay, now come on over here and let's look down this aisle. Do that to any one of those patches you want. And when you look down that aisle, you know what you're going to see? Weeds. Weeds. They've got to stay on top of it. Because weeds will start coming in. But he doesn't call it weeds anymore. What does he call it? Wheat. Because you're overplant. Anybody who has an oppression must overplant. You must start planting and planting and planting and planting and planting good words, powerful words, powerful things in your life. That's what you must do. That If I give you a prescription, if you come to my office and you're having problems in your life, that's the prescription you're going to have. And I can give you lists of people that will testify that their deliverance came the first night that we prayed for them and they started on this this road, you see, but you can always open yourself up again, can't you? All you got to do is be neglectful with that field. You go out there and tell, talk to some farmer. You neglect that field, you get weeds. You neglect your backyard, you get weeds. I don't touch my grass, I get weeds every time. I mow it, I do what I'm supposed to do, and it looks nice. There still may be weeds, but it looks nice. The same thing in your life. That girl planted. She has a harvest. You planted when you were not a Christian. You have a harvest. You don't have to dwell on your harvest. It doesn't have to be the predominant part of your life. But you have a harvest. When a person is in a cult, they have a harvest. Their mind says, I wonder if that was right. I wonder if this was right. I wonder if that is a... You know, all these things come back in their mind, you see? They have to overplant the right things in their mind. And in their, that's why the scripture says what? Renew your what? You renew your mind. Why do you renew your mind? Because you got all that trash in it. You see? Satan affects your mind. He affects your mind. And because that's the only way he can get you. He gets you through your eyes. He can get you through your ears. He can get you through your senses. And, and he works on your mind. And as he works on your mind, it starts to develop in your character, and then it progresses. The Scripture calls it activating and becomes sin. As you, as you read, you'll see that's true. So, you know, you cannot stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. Right? Right? And that's true. You, you can't stop from these things going on all around you because we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But the thing of it is, is we can, every one of us has a point of deliverance. Whether you know that or not, you do. It depends upon how much you've been planting in your new garden. If you haven't been doing your planting and you're wondering why your harvest isn't there because your old harvest is overpowering your new one. You see, it's there. It's just like you take a dart. You have a dart board and you throw that dart like that and you pull the dart out. That's when Jesus forgave you. Is there a hole in the dart board? It's a hole in the dart board. I want to tell you something. Jesus will heal you. He'll forgive you. He'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. But you know who can't hardly do it sometimes? You. You're your worst enemy. You can't quite forgive yourself. It's true. And Satan throws that back every time. He'll throw it right back on you, right back on you, right back on you. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the cults have a way of... uh, bringing a person's mind into captivity. And it is very, very hard for a person who's been involved in a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Moonies. I've had deprogrammed Moonies. 
Uh, you can call it deprogramming or reprogramming or whatever you want to call it. It is a long process. It's a long process. I've had the police department turn the people over to us. We've stayed right with them in the house for three days at a time and, and uh, prayed with them, talked with them. Uh, I've got there and the Moonies would get down the floor and start doing push-ups and say, Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon, you know, just over and over and over and over to kind of pump up their faith. You see, their, their minds have been affected. And any person who's been involved in a cult, I want to tell you something. Their mind has been affected. It takes replanting and a real powerful planting of the Holy Spirit in that person's life to overcome the old nasty harvest. You talk to any one of them. There's a girl that used to be a Jehovah Witness. She's here somewhere right there. Is that true? That's true. Thank you, brother. Glory to Jesus. It's anointed. Living water. It's true. It's really true. Every person I've talked to. Now, one thing, when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, you're not dealing necessarily with the occult. There is a difference between the occult and a cult. A cult is a basic uh, error in the Christian faith. That is really what a cult is. It is a group of people, whatever group, and they claim the backing of Christ and the Bible. And the whole idea is, is they have a different Jesus. That's the bottom line. If we want to do away with everything else, I can take you to churches in the United States tonight where uh, that sister right there, sitting right there, that pretty one right there with her elbow showing, would be unholy. It's true. Now, I go in that church and it bothers me because I think they're out in left field. And I think scripturally I can prove they're out in left field. There's no elbow that would ever get a man excited that I know of. There's no, 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 no luring in an elbow, you know, ah, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, um, it's true. And I've dealt with a lot of the pastors on that, but you see, it's a doctrinal point with them. It is a doctrinal point with them. Now, can we say, oh, that's a cult. Now, there are groups that say, no lipstick, no jewelry, no glasses. Now, that lady right there with them nice, shiny, pretty glasses, now, see, she'd, fall, she'd be really in deep trouble. It's too shiny, see? Too much glisten and uh, that sort of thing like that. Now, does that make that group, it, you can call it an overkill if you want to, an overholiness kill. I believe that the scripture defines that the first you cleanse the inside of the cup. And then the outside of the cup will reflect what has happened inside, right? And uh, that, that's how it happens. You don't clean the outside and then hope the inside is going to make it. And you can just do whatever you want. You can tape your lipstick off and you can do whatever you want. You can still be a character. And that, that's the way it can be. Now, does that make that group of people a cult? No. And I will tell you why. I think it's a heavy bondage trip, a man-made bondage, like a lot of different groups. But the bottom line is, do they have the same Jesus of the Bible? They do. They have the same Jesus. They believe that they believe in the Trinity. Now, there is a group that doesn't believe in the Trinity. I'm not talking about that group. I'm talking about the group that believes in the Trinity. They have a lot of other little things. And see, there are churches you can go to. Uh, uh, that brother right there with a, with a fairly long hair, he'd be an outcast, see? He'd be an outcast. They'd think he was just a burnout or a hippie or something. You know, I don't know what they'd think. He was just not spiritual or something. That's the biggest lie in the world. Because God doesn't look at his hair, looks at his heart. I mean, that's one of the first lessons I learned. And the exciting thing, though, you see, does that make them a cult? No, it doesn't. Because they've got the right Jesus. 
Now, you can go into a lot of these different groups, and you just find out if they have the right Jesus. Now, if they have the right Jesus, and all the other stuff is weird, then if you want to submit to that, that's up to you. You can still get saved. There are groups that say, don't eat meat. The Bible says, you know, everything is good. If you want to eat it, eat it. It's not going to kill you. It may kill you. I don't know. It might take you this life, but it has nothing to do with your eternal life. Right? There are a lot of things that are not good for you. But we're talking about eternal things. Now, we go to the issue of Jehovah's Witnesses. Do they have the Jesus of the Bible? No. Their Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They say before Jesus came to earth, he was an angel, and his name was Michael. The Bible in John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? An angel? Was God. Was God. Capital G-O-D. God. So I'm going to have to believe the Bible. Now how about the Jesus of the Mormon church? That's what we're going to cover tonight. The Mormons have another Jesus. They have another gospel. They have a lot of different things that are out in left field. And they are definitely a cult. And they are also involved in the occult, which is the mystery, the mysterious, the... Uh, the uh, delving into the um, things that really are occultic practices like speaking with the dead. How many know that Mormons actually have a ritual where they speak with the dead? They do. In their temple, they have that, where they speak with the dead. If you wanted to, uh, if you were in good standing, want to speak with your grandma or whoever, you go to the temple, they have the rites. And you know who they're speaking to? A familiar spirit. You see, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, not every little angel that appears is a good one. You know, just because an angel appears, people go, wow. Just like somebody said, I, you know, an angel appeared to Joseph Smith. I said, whoopee. How do you know it was a good one? That's the problem. You know, I had a Mormon ask me, he said, have you ever read the book of Mormon, Mr. Greasehaber? I said, no, I haven't. He said, and how can you be authority? I said, well, I don't have to read anything to necessarily be an authority. God has given me a brain. I haven't read the book of Satan, the Satanic Bible. And by the way, it outsells the Christian Bible on most of our campuses in the United States today. And that's awful sad. The Satanic Bible is becoming a big seller. In our country. And uh, he said, well, uh, would you mind getting down on your knees and praying about it? I said, not necessarily. I don't think I need to pray about it. I mean, if God's given me a brain, why, wash, why waste my prayer time on that? He said, well, doesn't the Bible say pray about all things? I said, yeah, all things I don't know. You mean, why would I pray about something I know? Wouldn't that be dumb? Wouldn't that be dumb to get down and say, is the Satanic Bible good? God, tell me. God said, dummy, get up. <laughs> right? I mean, there would be no wisdom to that. But if I would, Mr. Mormon, if I would, let's just say I got down there and I got your Book of Mormon and I said, God, is Joseph Smith a true prophet? Is that what you'd want me to say? He said, yes, that, that would do it. I said, okay, well, let's say I did that. What would I get? He said, well, I said, would I get something like this? Yes, he is. Did you hear a little kind of echo like that? He said, well, I doubt it. Well, how, what would you get? He said, most of us get a burning in the bosom. I said, a burning in the bosom? I said, you know, the other night my wife and I were at the Pizza Hut. I had one of those pepperoni deals. I had that burning in the bosom. Now, I didn't ask one thing about Joseph Smith. Do you think that could have been something? I said, now, isn't that ridiculous? 
Just because you get a burning in your bosom, a tickling in your ear, or a thump on your head, do you think that that's the Holy Spirit? I said, isn't that crazy? I said, if there was only one spirit in the world, just one, then you'd get down and get a burning and a buzzing and a thump or whatever you want, and you could jump up and say, that's it. But you see, we have other spirits. And the Bible says they'd love to give you a burning and a tickling and a twitching and the whole works. So you'd be out on your 10-speed someplace. Now, do you think that's what you should do? He said, no, I don't think that's what I should do. I said, well, that's the reason I don't do it. I said, first of all, you guys don't even have the name of your church right. That always gets them. See, because they say, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When you tell them they don't even have that right, that really gets them excited. They say, oh, yeah? I said, that's right. I said, let me just tell you what happened in the name of your church. According to Joseph Smith, the prophet, he was an instrument who God restored the church through. This is his statement. The precise day and the precise name of the church was given to him through divine revelation. And here is the name of the church given by divine revelation, is the church of Christ. Now, four years later, in 1834, the name of the church was changed. This is the name of the church now. The Church of the Latter-day Saints. Now, four years later, the name of the church has changed again. 18th, uh, April of 1838. This is the name of the church now. This time it became the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, doesn't it seem strange, Mr. Mormon, that God, through divine revelation, took eight years and three revelations to get the name right? He come down, he says, Ha ha, I fooled you, I'll give it to you again later. Right? Did he do that? I mean, is he restoring this or what? And they'll say, well, we don't know anything about that. Well, you better check it. You see, part of Mormonism is educating them what Mormonism teaches. Because most of them don't even know what they teach. We had two Mormon missionaries came over to the house. They sat down, and one thing about Mormons is when you pray for them, they don't mind praying with you. In fact, they'll be real nice, they'll smile, you know, and, and they just they just look real neat. And I said, do you mind if I just pray before we start this? And they said, oh, no, that would be wonderful. You know, they just want to be so pleasant, so sweet and nice, you know, and just, just like honey, you know. And I just got up and I laid hands on them. Now, see, they think that that's when they receive the Holy Spirit, when you lay hands on them. So that really gets them, right? And I laid hands on him. I said, oh, God, just show him that Joseph Smith is a false prophet. Let him know that Jesus is the truth and the way. And he said, and I just gave him a whole neat sermon, you know. And it was fantastic. They started kind of shaking and got all antsy, you know, and quivering like and everything. And at the end, both of those boys accepted the Lord. It was really neat. My wife and I have seen lots of Mormons except Jesus. In fact, there is a group... In California now, I don't know, you may have heard of it, it's called Ex-Mormons for Jesus. I don't know if you ever heard of that. But it's a group and it started in our vice president's office or in his home with a couple people that accepted the Lord. In fact, there's a group out now, it's really kind of neat, instead of Latter-day Saints, they changed it now, and the ones that are coming out, they call themselves present-day saints. Isn't that neat? So I, I think that's really great. and uh, But, you know, one of Satan's biggest things, and I think we have to really look at this, because in a lot of these groups, whether they're uh, Baha'i, I don't know if you ever heard of the Baha'i group and Baha'u'llah, but they always come around when there is a big uh, group of people around. Like we had a couple big conferences, and they'll float around out in the foyer and things like that. And I was out there, I don't remember what conference we were at, but I was out there kind of floating around in the foyer a little bit. And it was unbelievable. I came, I was just standing there, minding my own business. And this fellow comes up to me and he said, what do you think about, about the Baha'i? 
I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I can't believe this. God is bringing these people right to me. I mean, I'm just taking a break. And I said, well, I said, I kind of think it's just like your leader, a lot of Bahula. (laughs) And boy, I mean, to tell you, him and a couple others just took off out of the building, you know. But you see, they're never confronted. They're just never confronted. And so we need to confront these people. It's just like the the Moonies in the back here, right after Revelation, the Moonies will put what they call divine principles. And the divine principles, they'll tell you, is just nothing more, uh, this is what they say, than additional revelation. And they'll say, well, we believe the Bible, but we think that this this is uh, the latest revelation right here. Now, when you ask the Mormons... Do you believe the Bible? They'll say, of course, as far as it's translated correctly. See, they always throw that little (laughs) down the end there. And when you think about it, you think, oh, gee, maybe that it's just a word or something they're talking about. You see, they're not talking about a word. They're talking about whole paragraphs, whole sections. They're not just talking about a word. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that we allow... Satan to come to the Bible and say, well, we don't think the Bible's correct via Joseph Smith or Reverend Sun Yan Moon or whoever. We don't believe the Bible's correct. So then we start judging the Bible. But you know what the Bible says? It says, check the prophet, doesn't it? But you see, the prophet under the direction of Satan, has switched the whole thing, and now you've got all these Mormons checking the Bible, when actually the Bible is supposed to check them. You see how Satan can switch things? And he does it. So now when the Mormons talk to you, they'll say, well, we don't believe that section's translated correctly. We should be saying, hey, we don't believe you're translated correctly. You see? And we should challenge them with the standard of God's Word. Now, when they say that they don't believe the Bible is translated correctly and, and uh, things are changed and everything like that, well, let's check them out. Let's see if that's true. Uh, let's just look at the Bible. Turn with me, if you will. I'm going to give you some scriptures here tonight. If you'll turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Hope you brought your Bibles. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture. Now, I think that would cover cover to cover that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, that's pretty powerful. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That teaches that these men did not write in their own private opinions. That what they put down here... They were moved, and you can see that right here in verse 21, that they were moved by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit actually moved through them. Now, let me give you another one here. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, Verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, your Bible may say every Scripture, the same thing. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, does that mean that this section right here we can take out? Not if I say all Scripture or every Scripture. We may not understand it. I mean, we may not understand every little thing, and and I'm sure we don't. But that doesn't mean that it's not inspired of God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
for training in righteousness, now watch this, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Isn't that interesting that that was written to the first century Christians? The first century Christians were equipped for every good work. If he was in the first century, he was equipped for every good work. Why in the world did we need Joseph Smith if he was equipped? If he's equipped for every good work, we don't need anybody else. Right? We don't need Bahu'u'llah or we don't need uh, all these other guys. We need Jesus. If he equips us, we're equipped. Now, let's go a little bit further. I want to give you some more. Isaiah 40 Verse 8. Now, these two scriptures I'm giving you, you should write these down because these are powerful scriptures. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, I don't care how much you want to try to destroy it. You can go home and rip every page out of your Bible and throw it in the trash. You haven't destroyed anything but your own Bible. God's Word will stand forever. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether Mormons like it, doesn't make any difference. God said it'll stand forever. I'm not going to listen to Joseph Smith. What he says, I'm going to take God's Word and check him. God said it'll stand forever. Joseph Smith said it won't. Let's go a little further. I want to give you one more scripture on that. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, watch this, but my word shall not pass away. Isn't that neat? Heaven and earth will pass, the flowers will fade, the grass will wither, but my word shall not be destroyed. In other words, God's saying nothing can destroy it. Nothing can destroy it. But yet Joseph Smith said somehow down the line, God's word was able, man was able to distort and destroy his word. Now, you have to remember one thing. We're not talking about translations. There are lots of translations. If you want a good book on translations, let me recommend it to you. It's a little, it's a little paperback book, about $1.95. It's called Many Translations. It gives one good thing about the translation, one bad thing. One good thing, one bad thing. One good thing, one bad thing. When it comes to the New World Translation, it only gives one bad thing. Because there is no good thing. It's true. It's what it does. That's the reason I like it. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a great book. There are a lot of translations. And translations are used for a lot of different things. And uh, they're marketed for a lot of different areas. But that has nothing to do with the main Word of God. You see, if you really want to know exactly, go back to the Greek. Go word for word for word for word for word for word on the Greek. It's real boring reading, and I doubt if you'd read long like that. You'd go, ah, da 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 and you'd go, oh boy, this, I've had it. Give me the New American Standard, or give me the King James or something, in a way, then you'd read and you'd enjoy but if you want to study, then you go back to the original. And that's what we're talking about. Now, the Mormons have what they call the great apostasy or the great falling away. And what they mean by that is that uh, there was no representation of any Christian on the earth. And therefore, they needed to restore the true church of Jesus Christ. And in order to restore this, they needed a leader. And this leader was a prophet, and his name was Joseph Smith, supposedly. And they call that the great apostasy. And they say there was a, 
There was a big falling away. There was no nothing left of the church. And I agree with one thing. There is a falling away. There will be a falling away, even more so as we get towards the end. There'll be a great falling away. There'll be a big shaking going on, and people will fall, and they'll just, you know, they'll follow doctrines of demons. But the problem is, Or the truth is that there is always a representation of the true church on this earth. Always. There are people that will always fall away, but there are always true followers. Now, let me give you some scriptures that you can confront them with. It's in Matthew, and we'll stay in Matthew for a second. So go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. And let's look at verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now watch this. And the gates of hell shall not overpower it. In other words, even hell can't destroy it. It's going to be here. It'll always be here. See, God will always be. It'll always be with us. If anything leaves, it's us. We leave God. God doesn't leave you. In Matthew 28, verse 20. I love that song, He Was There All the Time. Because it really is. Matthew 28, verse 20. And there's a word in here you should underline in your Bible. Because on those stormy days, on those times when you are down, when Satan has you beat down to the ground with negative statements, negative thoughts, negative everything, and he has a good way of doing that. And when he has you down and you think everything is coming in on you, I want you to read this and remember just one word. And you know, God's word can get you excited when nobody else can. And here it is in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you part of the way. And then Joseph Smith's got to come and take it the rest of the way. No. And lo, I am with you always. When you have hard times, when you have good times, doesn't make any difference. He is always there. Now that word always does not have a break. You see that? There's not a break in there. The Mormons say, well, there was a falling away. We needed Joseph Smith to restore the church. That there was no representation of the church on earth. That's not true because the Bible says, I'm with you always. Now, he may not have been with a whole lot, but he was with some always. And he will be in the end. Now... The interesting part here is there's one scripture I believe that just fits the Mormon church to absolutely to a T. And I don't know of any other group in the world that this scripture will fit. If you'll turn with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy 1, and let's look at verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at emphasis in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. There are a lot of weird doctrines going on, just like there are today. Nor to pay attention to myths. A myth is like a little fairy tale. Now watch this. Don't pay attention to fairy tales and endless, what? Genealogies. Do you know that they have a five-story computer bank with endless genealogies in Salt Lake? Endless. If you want to find your family tree and you write in to Washington for any statistics, they're going to send you back the little bit that they have and then they're going to refer you to Salt Lake City. That's how powerful 
their banks of computers are. More than likely, you are on their list. More than likely in their computer bank. And the strange thing about it is, look what the Lord says. He said, Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. In other words, don't worry who your great-grandma was. If you want to go all the way back, it was Adam and Eve, then you can forget it. Amen? And you got to press on to the things that lay ahead. You see? That's the exciting part. And where the Mormons get off on this is they start tracking. I had one woman say, well, I just, I, I just don't have time for all this other Bible reading. I'm so busy working on my genealogy. You see how that can captivate a person? They're so busy into that stuff, they don't have time to further Christ. And that's where Satan pulls them off. Now, I'd like to deal with one other thing. A lot of people say, look how beautiful the Mormon church is. Look how beautiful the Mormon tabernacle choir is. In fact, a lot of Christians buy those records at Christmas time. And they play them. You know, they show this big pipe organ on the front. And I don't know what they charge for the record. But if you've ever bought one, break it. You know, just destroy it. It's junk. Never pay a penny to a cult. Just never do it. And there's too many good to invest in. You know, give them your money. Uh, put put some money in their thing. You know, uh, help them out a little bit. And, and get some good Christian stuff. But I've seen people and they say, here's the Mormon church. And one lady said, oh, we have such beautiful musicians. We have such beautiful bishops. Our buildings are so pretty. I mean, we have such a clean organization. You see, what looks clean is exterior. The Scripture says, clean the inside of the cup first. The Holy Spirit does that. Then the outside of the cup will become clean. All cults work on the outside first. Have you ever noticed? They always try to clean up the act on the outside. The inside is pathetic still. The Holy Spirit cleans the inside. And then kind of works out. Now, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, could an absolutely false church appear righteous? And they do appear righteous. Have you seen their commercials on TV? Fantastic commercials. I give them credit. Fantastic. You know, I mean, uh, just a work of art. They have a thing in, you remember Roots, when Roots came out? Man, everybody was, oh, Roots, you know, Rudy Toot Toot, right? Well, you know, Rudy Toot Toot, the Mormons picked up on that, and in the center of Reader's Digest, they had a big thing, find your roots. Man, everybody was sending in to Salt Lake, and you know what they found? Two Mormon missionaries standing at your porch. That's what they found. They didn't find any roots. All they wanted was a triple tithe. Let me tell you, a triple tithe is what they pay. 30%. A lot of them higher than that. The cults really don't just say 10%. They want it all. There are people in the Armstrong movement You'll see in the movie tomorrow night. Herbert W. Armstrong has paintings on his walls, oil paintings on every little available spot on the walls. He's got China that was owned by the Tsar of Russia. He's got a set of salt and pepper shakers on his table that are worth $25,000. I've got Tupperware. And I'm glad I got that. They seem to work just as good. You see the difference? And people will send in and send in and send in, and these cults are thriving. They're thriving. And people just don't know. They look so beautiful. I'm sure you've been over here at Big Sandy and seen some of that stuff going on. 
it just looks good, it looks impressive, it looks right. And uh, so, the question is, could a false church lo- really be uh, look real righteous? Look at what the Scripture says. In 2 Corinthians, just turn with me here to 2 Corinthians and we'll check it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because we have to give them credit. They do look good. They do look nice. If you had Mormons lined up on that wall, Jehovah Witnesses lined up on this wall, Herbert W. Armstrong's group over here, Gardner Ted's group over there, we can just throw them Baha'is and the Moonies and, you know, all but about the Krishnas, you know. Uh, I think we can pretty well get away. I, my wife and I were downtown San Francisco and we was waiting there at, at one of these little stops and the Krishnas were out there going, hey, Krishna, 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 you know, all bald-headed with a little ponytail, going at it, you know. And there was this very nice-looking, distinguished couple standing there waiting for the trolley. He had this nice little black hat on and she was just so, so, you know, I mean, she just nice, pretty little petite lady, you know, and just looked so neat and proper and all that stuff. And I turned to her and I said, how come you're not getting into this stuff? She said, that is so silly. She said, how can anybody believe that? I can't dance like that. Now, isn't that something? You see, they're qualified by how you can dance. Now, I never thought of that, right? You couldn't join that group because you can't get your legs in the yoga position, right? I mean, I couldn't. They'd carry me away like that. That was one of the qualifications. I had one guy tell me, I have people tell me crazy things. I had one tell me, he said, have you ever meditated? I said, no, I sure haven't. He said, well, then don't kick it. He said, until you get your mantra and get over there and get on that wall and go, mm, you know, he said, it just kind of, it just kind of gets you, you know, it makes you feel so good. And he says it lowers your blood pressure and, and just lowers everything else. I said, you're right. It's going to lower you too. I said, you know, if you went over there and you prayed for 15 minutes, when you come out of there, you'd be dancing like David danced. You don't want to be lowered. You want to be hired. Right? I want to go up. I don't want to go down. I want as much of the Lord as I can get. You'll see some of that meditation in the movie tomorrow night. That's one of the areas people can get demon-possessed real fast in meditation because you're meditating upon occultic, demonic spirits. And when you call upon them, let me tell you, they'll come. Don't think they won't. I've had little girls, 14, 15 years old. I had one the other day. She was, I think, 18, just came out of college. They had a whole group and they were messing around there doing a little meditation and just making it a game and goofing around and everything until she went to bed at night. She said she couldn't even sleep because she started seeing these things. And and these things started really appearing to her. She got so scared. She came home to her mom and dad and she said, and it still was there. She couldn't get rid of it. It's real, folks. When you play with the occultic game, it's real. All right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, watch this word, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. You see, he wants to be the light. That's Satan's whole trick. He wants to be the light. He can never be the light, but he wants to be. You see, he I call it a satanic sandwich. He just fixes it all up real pretty for you and he slips in the baloney, right? And that's what he does every time. And before you know it, you just, huh, you know, and you got the whole thing. And you just walk away and he's got you. He looks real good. Don't think Satan is stupid. The scripture portrays Satan as very brilliant, very beautiful, and, and he can, he can just uh, mess up minds. He's been doing it. You must know your enemy in order to do a little warfare. And part of it is to know that he is a 
that he disguises the ones that follow him. And the best way is through false religion. You see, it's not by being some wino falling out here in the street or some doper. Who's going to follow that? You might get a few other dopers, but nobody's going to think it's Christianity. Even the dopers don't think it's Christianity. I talked to enough of them. They know that. But you see, if you get somebody that looks like a Mormon, a Jehovah Witness, or some of these, and they think, boy, it looks so beautiful, it looks so right, you know, I mean, it's just so pretty. Well, that's what Satan does, you see? Let's go a little bit further. Okay, we cannot tell, according to that scripture, it says we can't tell by how they look. So if we look at the Mormons over here on this wall, not you folks, but the ones that invisibly kind of lined up there, that we can't tell whether they're... Uh, uh, right or not, according to that scripture. Well, maybe we can tell um, by what they say, huh? Maybe we can tell something by what they say. Let's take a look at that. In Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And let's start with uh, verse 22. Matthew 7, verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, there are going to be people saying, Hallelujah, Lord, Lord, praise God, you know, all those little cliches. They don't mean anything. It's just like salvation. It is just like salvation. I have given salvation invitations, and I've seen a boyfriend and a girlfriend sitting there, and the girl will be going like that, kicking them to go down front. Now, he'll come down front because she has bruised his leg. <laughs> right? Not because the Lord has done anything in his heart. And he's down here, and he goes through whatever you want him to go through, and he'll flap his lips, but that doesn't mean anything. You see, if there's not a conversion, if there's not a new creation, and all things have passed away, and all things become new, all he did was say words. And you can take him, and you can dunk him in all the water you want, and all he did was get wet. Doesn't mean a thing. And it's the same thing here. People, you, do you know that the Mormons speak in tongues? A lot of these cults and occult will speak in tongues. A lot of them will do miracles, so to speak. Well, so did these other magicians back here try to duplicate the real thing, didn't they? See? They'll always try to duplicate the real thing. That should pump you up. You should get so excited you jump up and scream. Because then you know that the real thing is there. You cannot duplicate something you don't have an original of. You give me an original $10 bill, we can duplicate it. You get the real tongues, then the fake comes. You get the real healing, then the fake comes. It's true. There is a real Jesus. There is a real Satan. There is a real healing... There is a real tongues. There is real miracles. These things are exciting and they're happening. They're happening. I'm expecting some great, fabulous things to happen in the church in the last days that we can, that'll just blow our minds. And I think we need to get ready for it or extend our faith for it. You know, beyond what we can even do. Because the occult, this country of ours, whether you know it or not, is experiencing an occultic revival. Do you know that? Look at NBC 2020. They've had programs on demonic uh, practices, witchcraft. I was in some towns and investigating the things of witchcraft that's going on right in the towns. The sacrifices, human sacrifices. You can't tell me that every kid on every carton of milk that his mama stole him or his dad stole him. I don't believe that. I believe a lot of them are sacrifices. A big group of them are sacrifices. In fact, on uh, one of these new shows, I forget what the lady's name is. 
Yeah, that's her name. Who said that? Yeah, that's her name. She had a program. I thought it was excellent. Had some girls on that program who had, had, maybe you've seen it, had her kids, had the kids at the daycare. Did anybody see that? They were sacrificing these kids at the daycare. They get the little kids, you see. They were, they were having rituals and witchcraft practices at the daycares. Now you may think that that's crazy. That's what the parents thought. Who would do that? The kids were coming home all cut up. They'd say, well, the t- teacher did that. And they'd say, oh, the teacher did that. I wouldn't believe it. Would you? My kid come home and said that. I wouldn't believe it. But yet, on her program, I think she had five or six ladies, every one of them that was happening to. You see, they'll take the little kids. Saintness take the little ones. Because if we take her out there and start, uh, we've got girls that they've taken out and sliced up, cut them all over their bodies, and sacrificed them up in the mountains. I can, I, I mean, we've just interviewed them, I know. They've done everything terrible in the world. I could just tell you on and on and on what happens. But I want to tell you something. Those people will fight back. If they take him up there and start slicing him, he's going, he isn't going to stand there and say, here, go ahead, give me one more, you know. He's going to run, he's going to pass out, he's going to scream, he's going to do something. Or you, you're going to do something. But you take a little one, pretty defenseless, right? I mean, really, what can they do? So they work on the little ones. They work on the little ones. And, you know, it's a shame, but it's happening. It is really happening. There is an occultic revival taking place in the United States. But... Jesus is coming soon. That's the answer. You see, when Satan, he's roaring, he's roaring out there like a lion because he knows what? Why is he roaring? Because the Scripture says he only has a little time left. A little time left. He roars. He does everything he can do. Not because he's coming in the sweet by and by, but because Jesus is coming soon. So when the Christians see all these terrible things that are happening, you don't have to go down like this and go, oh, gee, pitiful, ain't it? You just start looking up and start, you know, we don't praise God because of the terrible things that happen, but we know that because of those things, Jesus is coming soon. There's a victory in the air, and there's a defeat for Satan. Now, we cannot tell by what people say. They may say, Lord, Lord. They may look real pretty. Okay, well then, what do we, how do we know? This is how we know. In Galatians, go to Galatians. <clears throat> A lot of people try to um, figure out how to uh, determine when people look so good and they say so many nice things. Well, this is how we determine. In Galatians 1.8. Galatians 1.8. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by... Oh, well, let me get down a little further. We can read that, but let's go 1.8. But even though we are an angel from heaven, even though Eric, your pastor, Paul... Or an angel should appear right here, right now. Just poof, there he is, you know. Okay? An angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary... Now watch this, this is really exciting. Contrary to that which we have preached. Past tense. Past tense. you got to get that part. First century, there was a gospel being preached, Right? Okay, it says right here, but even though they would preach a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Well, that's a pretty heavy trip there. As we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. Now, the gospel that we're talking about right here is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. And let me just briefly just go over that for you. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you and which also you received and which also you stand, 
by which also you're saved, which you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel that they received. Now, according to Galatians, if anybody comes and preaches any other gospel, he's to be accursed. That's a pretty heavy statement there, isn't it? Not just let him alone, but he's to be accursed. You know? Now, is Joseph Smith... I mean, he's not preaching the gospel of this. The Watchtower Society is not preaching that gospel. But isn't it interesting that both groups say that they get it from an angel? Not every angel is on God's side. In fact, when you read Revelation, you find out that one-third of the angels is on Satan's side. Isn't that exciting? Because that means two-thirds are on our side. Love those odds. That's great. And you know, the exciting thing here is this is what motivates those boys out there on that 10-speed is because they have a different gospel. They don't have this gospel that we're talking about. What is their gospel? Here it is. I want to read it to you right out of their own uh, page and book here. This is their gospel. You have got to learn how to become gods yourselves. For I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. Now this comes out of their book, Articles of Faith, page 430. As man is, as that brother is right now, God once was. As God is right now, man may be. They have all the males that hold the priesthood working their way up to become polygamous gods. Isn't that something? Now, let's don't take Joseph Smith's word on the gospel. Let's take God's word and check and see if the gospel's right. Let's just see if that's right. In Isaiah, turn with me and just stay right there just for a minute. This is their main thing that motivates these boys out there. They want to become gods. Do you know how many people wanted to become gods before Joseph Smith came along? Plenty. None of them made it. They may have made it to become a god, but they became a god, a false one, because there's only one true god. In Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11, if you will just share these scriptures with the Mormon, it devastates them. Absolutely devastates them. They want to park their 10 speed fast. Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe me, not Joseph Smith, not Brigham Young, but Jesus, and understand that I am he. Before me, you should underline this, before me there was no God formed, and there'll be none after me. None after me. Well, what are all these guys doing then? They're all going to be gods. God said, there's none before me. There's none after me. Pretty powerful. Let's go a little further. Isaiah 44, they always say, this is what they'll say, oh, you can't just rely on one scripture. So let's give them a few more. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Now watch this. And there is no God besides me. Isn't that neat? Joseph Smith has got all those boys working their way up. God says, there is no God. Sorry. When you get there, you'll be false. Isaiah 44, verse 8. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me, or is there any other rock? I know of none. 
Well, I think I could give you more, but I think that, you know, we've, I've given you four or five. That should be enough to show there is no other God. There's gods of wood and steel and brass and gold and, and people working their way up to become gods, but they're all false. They're all false. There's only one true God. Now, I wonder who made up that lie before Joseph Smith. Let's go clear back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 starts off way back here. We'll catch the old guy right here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3. Genesis 3, verse 3. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. watch this, and you will be like God. Uh-oh, there he is, telling the original pair, you're going to be like God. You're not going to ever be like God. The scripture says you will become children of God. That's what the Bible says. When you receive the Lord, you become children of God. You do not become God. He is always the creator. You're always the created. You become children of God. And the and Satan lied to the original couple. You're going to be just like God. They never were. And from that point on, we've had... Nations falling because people wanted to become like God. Now, the exciting thing here is that you have a false gospel. You have a group that looks good, but it's false. You have a false gospel and a false doctrine. How about the leader? How about Joseph Smith? The Bible says and tells us how to check one who presumes to be a prophet of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, let's just take a quick peek at that. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 and 21, And you may say in your heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing, one thing, that's all we need, does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Okay, I don't think there's any question that Joseph Smith claims to be a prophet of God. Now, I just happen to have a list of prophecies that Joseph Smith made out of his own literature. And this one right here, I just really love. The Mormons don't, but I do. And this is what it says. It's concerning the inhabitants of the moon. They love that one. The inhabitants of the moon. The inhabitants of the moon are of more of a uniform size than the inhabitants of the earth, being about six feet in height. They dress very much like the Quaker style, and are quite general in style or fashion of dress. They live to be very old, coming generally near a thousand years. This is the description of them as given by Joseph the seer, and he could see whatever he asked the Father in the name of Jesus to see. That's in the Journal of Oliver B. Huntington, Volume 2, page 166. Now, here's my question. When Neil Armstrong, you know, I mean, well, let's go back a little further. When Joseph Smith made this prophecy in the early 1800s, he picked up his little rock and he put it on his head and he said, oh, there they are, Quakers. In fact, he even went on a little further in this prophecy. He said, when we get real big telescope, we're going to be able to see them. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good prophecy. He's pretty safe. He didn't know we were going to have Neil Armstrong walking on the moon didn't find one Quaker, <laughs> right? We didn't find one Quaker up there. We got a bunch of dust, a few rocks, moon rocks. You could find them at the museum. Don't you think if there had been a Quaker there, we'd have brought him back or said something to him? Six feet high, 
dressed like Quakers. You know, isn't that something? And then the one who followed him, Brigham Young, he said there were men on the sun. He had to outdo the other one. So we got our first Mooney and first Sunny there. It's unbelievable. I've had a Mormon jump up in one of my series and he said, we don't recognize that. I said, well, I wouldn't recognize it if I said it either. But it doesn't make any difference. There's the statement. Let me just give you one more. This one here is devastating because we went right to the temple site. I want to be sure to give you all their best arguments. This was a temple that was never built. In a revelation given by Joseph Smith, September the 22nd and 20, uh, 23rd in 1832. This is the statement. Verily, this is the word of the Lord. Now, I don't think there's any question about where he says this is coming from. That the city, New Jerusalem, shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, which is Jackson County, Missouri. Even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation, the generation of 1832. For verily, this generation shall not all pass away, the generation of 1832. You think they passed away yet? <laughs> Until the house shall be built unto the Lord, and a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. Therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the coming unto the Lord in this generation of 1832 upon the consecrated spot, Jackson County, Missouri, as I have appointed. I took my two daughters, my wife. We went to Jackson County, Missouri. We went to the land where this temple was supposed to be. And I'd just like to inform you, there is no temple. See? It's flat, desolate, nothing. And there's a little stone that sits there. And I sat my two daughters on that stone and I took a picture. No temple. Right? I went across the street to the Mormon Visitor Center. And I went in and there was a real nice bishop, whoever. And I said, Mr. Bishop, I have a question to ask you. I don't know a whole lot about Mormonism, but I do know a little about prophecy. And I said, you know, according to this prophecy, I said, do you have one of your Doctrine and Covenant books? He said, well, yes, I have. They all carry one, and they believe that it is as inspired as the Bible. They believe the same God that inspired the Bible inspired that book, Doctrines and Covenants. So I said, would you open it up to section 84? He said, of course. He opened it up. I said, look at verse 2 through 5. He looked at verse 2 and he even had them underlined. I noticed they were all, you know, kind of red underneath them. And I said, well, you know, here's my question. Where is the temple? I mean, according to that prophecy, these people that were living in 1832 were supposed to build a temple right there uh, where I just took two pictures of my daughter's on the blank ground. He said, well, let me tell you. Now, this is the best answer. We're going to build a temple there someday. I said, well, that's great. I said, now, here's my question, though. Where are those guys from 1832 that have to build a temple? See, according to the prophecy, it's going to be reared in the generation of 1832. Now, you got some guys around here that are living from 1832? Now, I don't know if you remember or not, but a while back, when I had asked that question, they had found a tribe someplace here in Africa, New Guinea or someplace, and these people were supposed to be real old. I don't know if you heard or remember about that, you know, like 85 or something like that, you know, untouched by civilization or something, you know, I don't remember how it went. And he laid that one on me. I couldn't believe it. Because that's even before they, they got the revelation on the blacks. He said... Well, this, this group, don't, you know, over here, uh, they'll probably be the ones. I said, boy, you're really reaching out there for them. I said, okay, let's just say that that's the group. You mean to tell me that you know how old these guys are? They're going to have to load bricks and build that temple? 
You got those guys over here, a hundred and some years old, loading bricks, going to work on that temple before the blacks can hold the priesthood? By the way, that was another joke. The only way they got that one across is supposedly they got a divine revelation. They didn't get anything divine. They got the NAACP knocking on the door in Salt Lake. That's what got the revelation in there, see? They got the word real quick that way. And uh, that was a, a pitiful situation. I don't even know how anybody could believe that, but they do. Nevertheless, when I went back over there, I said, well, if you're going to build that temple with these old people, then let me ask you one other thing. Who owns the property? They said, well, we're trying to buy it, which I already knew they were trying to buy it because I already found out who bought it. And they said they would never, ever, ever sell it to the Mormon church. I tried to buy the property. I didn't care. I would to put a grocery store on it or something, a filling station or something. But it wouldn't have ever been a temple. And they asked me, they said, well, are you a Mormon? I said, no. I said, I, am, I just know that this is so false. And they said, well, in our thing, in our deed of trust or whatever, they have in there never to be sold to the Mormon church. So I said, now, Mr. Mormon, I've got a copy of the title, of the deed, of the whole thing, of their statement of, of uh, fact. I said, I can show that to you. You guys have already been over there offering them millions of dollars for this little hunk of nothing just to try to prove your point. I said, you have no people living of 1832. you got men on the moon, Quakers. I said, now, what's going on? I said, what do you have that would make me want to be a Mormon? I said, I, it just amazes me that you'd want to work here at the visitor center. He said, well, I'm going to have to study that. I said, it doesn't take too much studying to just look out the window and not see a temple. <laughs> right? I mean, you don't have to study that one long. I said, listen, I, I'll just, uh, how about if I pray with you? He said, I'm not ready right now. <laughs> Figured I'd pray with him right in the temple. We got up and we left because he didn't want to do anything else. When we were in Salt Lake, we were touring Brigham Young's home. Has anybody ever toured Brigham Young's home? Back there? That is something. Do you ever have a chance? I don't know whether I'd send you there or not, but it's kind of pathetic. But we were going through there, and they've got, had this real nice girl, and she's touring us through, and she said, oh, Brigham Young was so wonderful. He was just so wonderful. What a wonderful person he was. And I was getting sicker by the moment. And as we were going, they had these little rooms, like little cubby holes, you know, just a room here and a room here and a room here and a room here. And, uh, and I said, well, what are all the rooms for? And I had this whole group of, of people, you know, that's touring us through. And she said, oh, Brigham Young, he was such a wonderful man. You know, at that time, we didn't have welfare. And uh, he would take in these widow ladies and things like that. And uh, they got to be in each one of these rooms. Is that a, huh? Is that a line? And I said, oh, isn't that something? I, and I said, well, there's never, you know, I mean, it, it, it's really kind of strange, you know, that and she said, oh, and she said, you know, and they were all pretty homely. I said, well, they couldn't have been too homely. He had 47 children, didn't he? I said, well, yeah, yeah, he did. And then he went on with the tour, you know, didn't, didn't want to stop and talk too much. He had... He had, in all of these little rooms, see, he put them in all these little rooms, and he had like 60-something waiting outside in another house. I mean, he was something else. He'd run one in, run one out, or whatever. I don't know how, what he had going there. But uh, it was unbelievable. And so we toured through all of that, and we went through this place, and we were passing out tracks, and, and uh, it was just a wonderful time. And we just had a great time. In fact, we had some of our friends went over there and had a booth at the state fair. That was really exciting. You, it really is. I mean, you're going right into the heart of the whole thing. You set up an anti-Mormon booth at the Salt Lake City State Fair. You've asked for it, you know. And uh, they had at least five Mormons a day except Jesus at their booth. 
So it has, it was really a, quite a blessing. And uh, my wife and I went to New York to the world headquarters for the Watchtower Society and went in through there and uh, passed out tracts and everything. We didn't last too long. They asked us to leave pretty quick. And uh, wanted to actually throw us out is really what they wanted to do. My wife started backing up, you know, when these look like muggers come to throw me out, you know. And we went out, we passed out tracts, and one of the leaders resigned. Uh, he was on the board of directors, and they had told me that our tracks were the first ones to ever penetrate their world headquarters organization. And it was kind of a real bold move, and I, I would never do it, I guess, again, unless the Lord really prompted me to do it. But, you see, sometimes you've got to do that. 